on camera. Today's June 22nd, 2017. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer at the History Center. And with me is Roger Swasset, who is also a volunteer at the History Center, and Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're very honored to have with us today Mr. Jesse Beck. Mr. Beck is a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, which is extremely unusual, and we're really looking forward to hearing your story, Mr. Beck. Could you give us your full name and the city and state where you currently reside? Jesse Ray Beck, Roswell, Georgia. Any zip? No, that's fine. Okay. Where and when were you born? January the 19th, 1926, at Foss, Oklahoma. Foss is a dumpy little thing. I think I was there in later years, and I think they had one store that was operable and had a post office. But we were actually in a postal area. That's where I was born, in a postal area. Okay. Well, tell uh, us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, uh, my father had a, a quarter section of land uh, over about uh, four or five miles from Foss. It had two streams running through it. And he had, he farmed cotton and oats and things of that nature, feed for the horses and cows. And uh, I went to church every Sunday, to the Baptist church. <laughs> and as you might imagine, back then, uh, air conditioning, I don't think, was on, even on the horizon, at least in the countryside. I can remember very well sitting by my father and the preacher's up there and every now and then he would raise his voice and I think he was trying to wake everybody up because it was so hot in there <laughs> <laughs> that I personally was trying to sleep. <laughs> and I related this story to my oldest sister four or five years ago and she says, that didn't happen. <laughs> it's not the way she remembered things. <laughs> but anyway, I, I uh, let's see, my mother gave birth to 11 children and eight of us grew to adulthood. And I, by the way, am the, lo the lone survivor of those children now. Three of them, uh, died at birth or shortly thereafter. So eight of us grew to adulthood. Um, I also had three half-siblings, a, a, a brother and two sisters from my father's previous marriage. Um, he farmed with the horses. We raised pigs. We had I think we initially had five milk cows, and uh, in, in, in the 1930s, the government men came and killed three of them, uh, two of them, I'm sorry. That left us with three. Now, why did they do that? Well, I think the theory was if you reduce the, the end product, prices will rise. Oh, okay. Don't think that worked too well. Was this during the Depression? Yes. Okay. This was in the 30s. Okay. I would say about 34, 35, somewhere in that okay. vicinity. And I know that my father uh, decided that he knew the government men would come, up, come around again. We eventually had to uh, plow up every fourth row of our crops for the same reason. Okay. And he reasoned that they were going to come around for the pig population. So he killed and dressed out, I think it was three, maybe four, yearling pigs and took them to people in the little town where we went to church that he knew needed the food. 
So he, he stole a march on the government men. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> uh, he passed away when I was 11. And my mother moved us to a little farm over west of Dill, a little town where we went to church. And we stayed there for a year, and then we moved to New Mexico. And she built a house on the quarter section that my father had settled on before, homesteaded. So he had rights by virtue of homestead. And looking back, I think that was a very gutsy thing she did because yeah. when, she, when she arrived there, the thing had been part of a wrench for many years. And so she had to break ground for, to, to, to plant uh, food for the animals and acquire, I think we acquired two cows and eight or 10 chickens and pickings are kind of poor that year. I think we had biscuits and gravy for breakfast, and then we had gravy and biscuits for lunch meal, and then we had biscuits and gravy again for the <laughs> supper meal. She wouldn't allow us to eat the eggs because she had to trade those for staples at the store. And she was on her own. She was not married now. Your she, father she, passed away. Correct. She had a sister living in Portales, the county seat. And they were getting uh, what was then called uh, surplus foods from the Department of Agriculture. And she recommended that my mother apply for those also. Yeah. And she refused because that was charity and she wasn't having no part of that. Wow. <laughs> Looking back, <laughs> that was my mother. Yeah. Well, how did she have enough money to even feed you biscuits? The money was generated by those eggs, oh, okay. which was damn little money, of course, yeah. but enough for staples, salt and pepper and all that kind of stuff. And uh, she managed that for... A year, year and a half, two years, and then my stepfather came along and decided that this this lady was for him. And he was a good fellow. Well, it sounds like she must have been a heck of a woman. I think she was. I didn't realize at the time. Of course, you know, you, before your age age of twenty, you uh, at some point. Uh, recognize that you already know about 95% of what's worth knowing. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> and then it takes you about eight or 10 years to discover that ain't so. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. <laughs> but uh, he treated her well. And he treated, at that time there were two younger sisters and a younger brother and I that constitute the household. And he treated us all well. He was going to discipline my younger brother once and I intervened like a damn fool. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't apply the, the rod that time. I don't think I ever did that again. <laughs> Not because I smartened up or anything, no. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. So, you're in Oklahoma, you're in high school, I assume. My Mexico. high school was in New Mexico. I mean New Mexico, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I went to Floyd. It, it, was, it was called Floyd High School, but it also included grades one through, through 12. Okay. So it was more than just a high school. We had a, we had a basketball court that was partially underground which at the time, I understand when it was uh, built, it was a, a real advancement over what had been the case before, which means that considering how the wind blows in New Mexico, can you imagine all those bank shots <laughs> <laughs> if you're outside? So inside, 
we had to make sure it was under the ceiling because <laughs> it wasn't very, very deep. Were you still in high school when World War II broke out? Indeed. Uh, when we were sophomores, I'm sorry, when we were juniors, I think that whole year there were two classmates of mine and I would go up ever so often to the recruiting office. And uh, we, we had it all figured out. One was going to be the pilot, one was going to be the bombardier, and one was going to be the navigator, but we were going to be on the same mm -hmm. crew in whatever service we could get into. Yeah. So we would go into this recruiting office, and they would ask these two what how, their age is, and, and they would say 17, and he, and he would say, well, if you're with your mother's permission, we can do that. They came to me, and I said 16, because I didn't feel like I could lie. Yeah. He says, we can't take you, son. And these two would get up and say, okay, if you can't take him, you can't take any of us. <laughs> we, we would all walk out. Well, the next year, they both got into the service. One went to the Air Force and one went to the Marines. And I got a, an attack of common sense and decided I would finish high school. And I was able to do so by virtue of the fact that my principal interceded with the draft board because the 19th of January, I was uh, 18, and that was draftable age, but but he uh, prevailed on them they allowed me to finish that final semester. And World War II had already started by now. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. This was this was 1944, yeah. so, and I do not remember what I was doing when Pearl Harbor came along. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was there in the community, yeah. but you remember the reaction of the people or the impact of the town? I don't. Yeah. How did your uh, mother and your stepfather feel about you going into the service? I think that they both felt it was inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, I never heard them voice any uh, mm -hmm. problem with it. They may have had problems, but they didn't let me know about it. Yeah. Well, talk about your military service, which was extensive, but you know, starting out when you first went in, a little bit about your training and where you went and what you did. I can remember catching that bus. As graduating seniors, we, we were allowed to have a, a trip, and we, we took a trip to Rio Dosa, New Mexico. Have you ever heard of that? It's a It's a pretty nice resort. Governor uh, Long from Louisiana was partial to Rio Dosa. Okay. Anyway, we had this senior trip and, and the idea was that I was to be out there on that highway when the bus came by on my way to being inducted into the Army on the, on the 15th of May and the next morning I was inducted. Selected by my friends and neighbors, that is. <laughs> and. Uh, I learned what it was to be, like to be on KP. That was one of the longest 14 or 15 hours I ever spent in my life. <laughs> and you know, you're you're the lowest form of animal life when when, when you're first in the army. As a as a matter of fact, they they were they took great pride in telling us that uh, we could wear our uniforms. That is, when we finally got to go go to town, we could wear our uniforms, but we couldn't put any brass on because we weren't soldiers yet. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back, it's it's laughable. It wasn't so funny back then. Yeah, you, you weren't laughing too much then, <laughs> no. were you? <laughs> and the girls in Anniston, Alabama, a lot of pretty girls. It didn't make two hoots in hell because they knew how much a, a private made, and, and we didn't have much left anyway. <laughs> so why should they give us a time of day? It was bad news, it really was. <laughs> so you, where did you go from there? Uh, Fort Meade, Maryland, on my way to uh, Europe. Okay. 
and that was we had some kind of processing there. I don't even remember the kind of exercise we had, to tell you the truth. But then we went to uh, Camp Miles Standish, which is outside of uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and the snow was on the ground, and we nevertheless stripped to the waist and had calisthenics like we had had before. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting, <laughs> being out in that snow like that. Yeah, I guess it was interesting. <laughs> it wasn't so terrible, but it felt like it was going to be terrible, you know. Well, now I see on here Fort Bliss, and uh, were you at Fort Bliss at some point in El Paso? That, uh, I, my, that was my induction point. That's where you was went Fort Bliss. Okay. And by the way, an old red-faced sergeant was out there as the first sergeant of that company, and he would bark and growl at us, you know, and he sounded like the world was going to come to an end if we didn't move fast, you know. <laughs> and when I came back from Europe in World War II, there he was again, by golly. Wow. <laughs> Still there. <laughs> I guess that was his partition in the war effort. Participation, I meant to say. Yeah. Uh, you probably learned a lot from him, though, didn't you? Or yes, did you? I did. Inevitably, you learn a lot. <laughs> Your first morning, you learn a lot. <laughs> okay, you're up in Boston. Now, let's go from there forward. Okay. We went over on, uh, I think it was the USS Mount Vernon, if I'm not mistaken. An interesting thing, you know, the, the companies were formed just because you had a bunch of replacements. Mm -hmm. So the company meant that you were in this organization for the purpose of moving to another area. There was an Italian fellow there. He had curly red hair, and I didn't, I didn't think Italians had anything but black hair, you know. And I noticed that every time he was given an order, he would talk back to the sergeant. Or whoever was giving the order. And it usually included profanity. And I wondered how long he was going to get by with this, you know. I figured he'd be court martialed or something. Yeah. Well, it was his notion that if he got court martialed, as a matter of fact, he said this one time when the, when the sergeant corrected him. He says, What are you going to do? Throw him in the stockade? He said, I'm going to have to fight. He had come over to the United States to avoid the draft for the Italian army. Oh. And here we drafted him, he's going right back. You know? Poor guy can't get Poor away guy. And he went over me on the same, with me on the same ship. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, was something else. Did you get to know him pretty well? Did he talk about what was going on in Europe at the time? He was not one of my closer uh, acquaintances. I just, I heard him a lot. Yeah. Because he he, did, he didn't mind sounding off. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he was getting the raw deal. I guess he was, and from his point of view. Yeah, I'd probably feel the same way. So where did you land when you first uh, got to Europe? Liverpool, and we took a train down to Southampton. We started marching up to a a little temporary cantonment area on, on a hill. And we marched by a coal bin or coal bins. And we thought, gee, that maybe we can have a fire because you could already tell it was awful cold. And Europe is a damp cold. So even if you have on warm clothing, eventually it's going to seep into your bones. You know, it's, that's just the nature of damp coldness. Yeah. <clears throat> Turns out we were not allowed to use any of that coal. So we had this little old stove. At the bottom, I think it was about eight inches in diameter, and then it was about six inches from there on up. And I couldn't see how much, see how it would have much, much ability to have a fire in there in the first place. But nevertheless, there were only two or three of us in that particular tent, and uh, we managed to have a fire because those cots will burn. 
They were short a couple of cots the next morning, but we did have a little fire. But you stayed warm. Yeah. I mean, come on, you can't just sit there and lie there and freeze. We had, your, your allowance was two blankets and that big old horse blanket overcoat, the, the OD. And uh, even with two blankets in that coat, it was still awful cold. Now, what unit were you in at the time? I didn't get to a unit until I, uh, I landed at La Harve, went from Southampton to La Harve, took a 40 and 8 from La Harve, and if you've ever noticed a map of France, there's a little corner up in the north east and Givet, G-I-V-E-T is there. They had a replacement depot at Givet. We drew our rifles at Givet. We were supposed to zero in the next morning. And you were also supposed to clean all that cosmoline out the same day. I never could get close enough to that hot water to, to clean any cosmoline. So next morning I, got, I go out I've still got cosmoline in my rifle. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to do because I'm, you know, I'm going to have to put that eight rounds in there and zero that weapon. Well, I finally got it to go to, to seat and I finally got around in the chamber. And then I decided I would turn my head just in case it blew up. At least I'd have the helmet between me and the, and the explosion. It didn't blow up. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> You'd probably be without it one ear now. <laughs> yeah. Or a head. Or a head. <laughs> yeah. Now, what's the timeline here? What? Um, this would have been, this would have been in mid-December because I did get to my unit in time to to participate in the Battle of the Bulge. And this is 44? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, talk about that. I mean, that's one of the most written about battles in American military history. W would you talk about that? Yes, I will. Uh, first of all, we're, we're at, we're in a, there's a, just a great big open space there and all these trucks were uh, pulled in there with, with troops on them. And this old master sergeant was out there uh, and his spiel was, uh, you fellows that, whose name starts with A, B, and C, I know you've uh, had a lot of details because, extra details because of the spelling of your name. So I'm going to give you a break today. And I said, yeah, you sucker, you're going to give me a break. <laughs> Well, sure enough, he called off names starting with A through H. And he said, okay, get on that truck over there. You're going to the second engineers. So I became an engineer instead of an infantryman right in that instant. Okay. Huh. We, when I got to my uh, unit, which was B Company of the 2nd Engineer Combat Battalion, 2nd Infantry Division, we got one week of training in how to be an engineer. We were taught a little bit about mines, about laying barbed wire, about picking up mines. And uh, of course, if you can handle a pick and shovel, you're automatically a combat engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually picked up mines the Germans had these box mines and they would nail them to a one before, approximately eight feet long. Maybe it was 10, I'm not sure. But these mines would be on this one before. And what you do is just tie a rope around one end of that thing and you tie that to the other end of the truck and you back off and if they don't explode, you're home free so far. And I, God was with us, I'm sure, because 
one outfit in my unit piled up a bunch of those things, one, one on top of the other, in the back of this truck was going to haul them off for destruction. They didn't go off. That's why I thank God was with us. Soldiers do some of the dumbest damn things sometimes. <laughs> you don't think it's dumb at the time. You're not noted for deep thinking. That's what the problem is. <laughs> uh, the Hurtgen Forest is where we were operating at the start, and even then, I, I could tell it would, would be a beautiful place if there, weren't, if there weren't a war and you could clear, clear away all these d destroyed trees, it would still be a beautiful place. But the snow was like this, God. right up to the knee. Wow. <clears throat> I had a couple, an instrument or two, we had, a, we had a short conversation and they would say, I wouldn't have your job for all the tea in China because you go up in front, of, in front of us and you pick up mines and all this sort of stuff. I said, man, I wouldn't have your job for all the tea in China because I don't have to spend 24 hours a day in this blooming snow, and you do. The truth of the matter is we could at least get into a truck and cover up with something, or maybe a house was nearby. So we had it better from that point of view over in Efterman. Was my disposal your primary assignment? My, mine disposal going, trying to locate mines and deactivate them? No, it, we, we are, a comm engineer is doing whatever needs to be done to advance the fighters, okay. the, the infantry and, and the mechanized people. So you're hiring roads and you're eliminating uh, impediments from the road and you're constructing temporary bridges to get over rivers. Okay. Or, in one case, <clears throat> I, f I helped a ferry across the Roer River, R-O-E-R, uh, elements of our 23rd Infantry Regiment of the 2nd Infantry Division. And that was kind of interesting. You go over and you land, and when you come back, you start here, but you're way down here due to the due to the tide by the time you get to the other bank. In the meantime, these tracers are coming over your head, and, and you're, you, you're kind of hunkering down because you don't want to get up in that line of fire. That was kind of an interesting yeah. proposition. That was at, at Hamlin. Have you ever heard of the Pied Piper of Hamlin? Yes. Well, that's where we have to cross that Roar River. On another occasion, we were trying to put a temporary bridge over a stream. <clears throat> we were on the western uh, side of the river, and we discovered, we, we heard this 88 round coming at us, and uh, we knew it was going to get Hand, uh, land kind of close. The fact is it landed in the bank probably about eight feet down and my thought was, man, if that sucker had just raised it just a tiny bit, I wouldn't be here. Most, most of us wouldn't be here. They were very accurate with that 88. Very accurate. They didn't have to, they didn't have to zero in like we did. Very interesting. I started becoming a deep thinker after that. <laughs> yeah. Did you have members of your unit wounded as you were advancing? I remember one fellow, uh, they didn't call it PSD back then. Uh, Probably call it shell shock. Yeah. yeah, that's what they called it. One fellow rotated back to a general hospital, I guess, because of that. That's the only one I remember. Yeah, yeah. So even though we had uh, occasionally we had ammunition coming at us, mm -hmm. 
It didn't it didn't get any of us. Yeah. We were lucky. Okay, you crossed the Roar River and you continued to move east. Uh, yeah, soon? by then, or shortly thereafter, the Germans couldn't move fast enough to to keep ahead of us, so they had to surrender. Mm -hmm. I can remember seeing a classmate of mine. That is, he was a he was in a class after mine, and he was on a horse, and he I forget how many. Germans he had, but it must have been a, a whole blooming division. Lots of men had surrendered, and he was helping to herd them back to a collecting point. And I, I was able to do this, and that's about it. I couldn't, couldn't even talk to him. Yeah. I, I've often wondered if he remembers that. We, uh, we kept on going. We came into Magdeburg. We continued east towards uh, north of Nuremberg, <coughs> where, where the Russians met, uh, where the where we met the Russians. And by the way, a member of my church turned out to be in a in a 69th Infantry Division. He was an artilleryman, and uh, he and I discovered that we'd been elbow to elbow, and oh. we didn't even know it. How about that? But when they met the Russians, I think my division was on, on the right lower flank of, of that division that met the Russians. Hmm. From there, we went into Czechoslovakia, An interesting thing, <laughs> talking about doing dumb things. We were uh, we were guarding uh, German prisoners while they cleaned up the city of uh, Pilsen, and uh, a fellow from Brooklyn, New York, his name was Averna, and he thought it would be a great idea to have those prisoners marching, singing the German army song. The Czechoslovakians didn't care for that very much. So somebody finally came out and told him to knock it off. But it, it worked really well. He, all he did was he, he got one of these uh, master sergeants that was a prisoner and told him to start it off, and he did. Those prisoners came to like that, and they were marching like this, you know. It was a sight to see. <laughs> Probably sounded pretty good, too. Yeah, it did. No question about it. Did that sign become prohibited after the war? Did you know what I was? Uh, well, it, I don't know about that, but it was, it was definitely from a common sense point of view, prohibited right then and there. <laughs> it's just, I mean, come on. Those Did, poor people had been uh, on short rations and all sorts of indignities for years. Another thing, when we went into Pilsen, they issued an order that we would not accept food from the inhabitants. But let me ask you this, if you have two or three little old ladies who have baked sweetbreads and they've got it on a tray and want you to mm -hmm. help them eat it, are you going to be able to tell them no? <laughs> You'd hurt their feelings. <laughs> of course. <laughs> they shortly thereafter moved us out to a smaller place. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of undeep thinking. <laughs> so you had some contact with the local Czech people oh, apparently. Oh yes, I was very impressed with them. They're very, very friendly and they're, they're very clean. You see these, when you pass by, you'd see these ladies out there scrubbing on their front stoops. I mean, they were cleaning inside and out, wow. evidently daily. I doubt that, but yeah. they were sure out there when we were coming by. So where did you proceed from there? <clears throat> the
they had a point system, uh, and of course, uh, coming in late as I had, most of us did in that unit, uh, my point total was pretty low, not enough to even worry about. They said the second division was going to go to the United States and get ready to go to the Pacific. So that's what we were headed for. Okay. Before we get to that, let me ask, you said you were there for the Battle of the Bulge. Yes. Where were you when the Germans conducted their counteroffensive? And... When we were at Gavay <clears throat> and we were issued our rifles, I'm told that the next day after we moved out, that's when the Germans came in. So that had to be around the 16th yeah. or mid mid December. Yeah, okay. And uh, so I guess I was there at the start of the yeah. darn thing, or close to it. So was Czechoslovakia your last stop? In it was. Europe? It was, and we were, we were headed back west to get on a ship to come come to the United States. Okay, talk about what happened from that point. Well, we, uh, I remember, remember coming into Nuremberg and of course there was destruction all yeah. over. The, I mean, the city looked like it, to me, it had been leveled. I mean, there was no building standing. So when they started having, for example, the, uh, the, the court cases mm -hmm. after the war, yeah. I'm wondering, what building did they find that was enough to hold a court case in? Yeah. Because I thought it was level, but I, evidently yeah. I wasn't seeing as much as I thought I was. Yeah. We came on west, and I always try to get this in. We had to cross the Rhine River again, and somebody was thoughtful enough to stop and we all got to pee in the Rhine River. <laughs> that was a special event. There. Yes, it was. <laughs> Our last shot at the Germans, I guess. <laughs> That's good. I haven't heard that one before. It's <laughs> quite an experience. So what was everybody's attitude as you were heading back west, knowing there's a chance you're going to be in the Pacific? Well, <clears throat> I like to think that uh, that I can figure out the attitude of, of the average soldier, and mine was, that, you know, the war's the war's not over, so somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Why not me? Yeah. And uh, it's sort of a fatalistic point of view because you know, back then you didn't, you weren't uh, drafted for a particular period of time. You were the, drafted for the duration of war and then some. Yeah. So you you had no ex expectation of yeah. being finished with war. So I think it was just sort of a fatalistic. Yeah. So be it. That's the best attitude to have in that situation. I think so. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to wear yourself into an early grave. Okay, continue with your your journey. Um, we came into a series of uh, replacement depots in France, temporary depots just for the purpose of assembling troops and moving them out. And uh, there was a Camp Lucky Strike and a Camp Old Gold and Philip Morris and what have you named after cigarettes. And somewhere along the way there was a little dog, I swear that little thing was maybe nine inches long. He would fit into this pocket on the field jackets that we had, were wearing at the time. And 
they put out the word that there would be no pets taken on the ship. And I thought that finished the thing. I mean, I wasn't going to have a pet on the ship. Well, sure enough, we, the platoon carpenter, he was a T4. A T4 is a, a guy that's three stripes with a T below it. He had made space in his duffel bag for that little dog, and he just went up the gangplank, and we we brought that little dog home, or he brought it home. Really? <laughs> Deep thinkers. <laughs> he made it happen. Though. Yeah. <laughs> so, where did you land? What, what, what was your next round of training or assignment? Or? We landed in. <clears throat> We landed in New York, and uh, as we got off the ship, we were assigned to uh, cars on the on, on the on the railroad <coughs> lines. And I still don't quite understand how they got me on a car going to Fort Bliss, but that's where I was headed to Fort Bliss. Okay. And I made made contact with a fellow that uh, was in my unit all this time, but I didn't know him. Uh, his name was Julio Cano, C-A-N-O, and we had a couple of days at Fort Bliss before we were processed to go home, and so Julio suggested we go to uh, El Paso and go get something good to eat, and uh, he was, I think his mother was Italian and his father was Spanish, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, one or the other. So we went into this place and I had never had a taco. And he ordered tacos and I said, well, why not? We'll try them. And then there was some green pepper sauce, Ooh. something. And uh, I noticed he was eating that stuff. <laughs> So he suggested that I try it. <laughs> I'm awful glad I had a beer. Because <laughs> I'm telling you, my mouth was on fire. <laughs> but he was sitting there just just like it was an everyday thing with him. I suppose it was. Yeah. <laughs> my education continues. <laughs> Learning something every day, aren't you? Yeah. And from there, we... Uh, I got on a bus and went home to spend my 30 days of, for the purpose of rest and rehabilitation. And that was enough time, by the way, for the, the uh, war in the Pacific to be over. Oh, okay. And I discovered this. I was out with a friend. Uh, he had a, he was already out of the military and was able to procure a truck and we were hauling something. And we came into Clovis, New Mexico, uh, and people were saying, you know, people out there ho hooping and hollered by the by the highway, and uh, we slowed down, and several people said the war's over. Wow. It didn't really sink in at that moment, but I felt a little shortly after that. I was glad I didn't have to go to Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so then all I had to do was go back and 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 report when my we leave was over to report to my uh, okay. my post and uh, I was then sent to a War Department Personnel Center at Camp Chaffee, Arkansas, <clears throat> where I was involved in the business of discharging personnel from the Army, and eventually. I went from Camp Chaffee to F Camp Fannin, Texas, and then to Fort Bliss, Texas. And finally, I'm still a PFC and I'm discharging people that had much less service than I did, who had never been overseas. So, the old deep thinker, I, I was having a beer and uh, PX there one day and the first sergeant was there and I, I pointed out to him that 
I'd been in long enough to know how to goof off <laughs> and that uh, uh, if I was sent to the stockade, at least I wouldn't have to work so hard and who, and who cares. Uh, I'd like to be promoted. And by golly, the next month I was promoted to corporal. Wow. <laughs> I thought he was going to throw me in the stockade. <laughs> But he didn't see it that way. He he saw the he said, I guess he saw the wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> paid to ask, didn't it? Yeah. So did you stay in the military between I, then and the? I did not. Uh, I I I got out in uh, June of June of 1946. <clears throat> I got. I went to the college there. At that time, it was Eastern New Mexico College, and enrolled. And I even got a job, paying thirty-five cents an hour, cleaning the latrines. The problem was I couldn't get enough hours to make enough money to even have pocket change. So eventually I just decided I would delay college for a while because that was not a good situation. Yeah. They had they had, had it figured out so that the tuition and so forth cost just enough to eat up the GI Bill. Yeah. So there was no money yeah. aside from that. So it took me a while. I was forty I think I was forty five when I finally finished college. <laughs> But you well, I made it. Yeah. <laughs> I went to law school. Did you really? Yeah. So, I want to go back before we get into your Korean experience. I see something here about the Middle East theater. Did you serve in the Middle East theater? Ah. Oh. Oh, that was the name of the campaign. May I see that a minute? Sure. Is that, are you talking about Central Europe? Um, let's see. Metals, African Middle East. African Middle East medal. Yeah. And it says War Operation Middle East, Middle East Theater. Theater. Yeah. You know, maybe even Czechoslovakia counted it as that at it the may time. Have. Let me see that again. Sure. And that's not essential that we talk about that. I just wanted to be sure we didn't skip over something you wanted to talk about. Oh, okay. That was the name of the medal, the uh, European African Middle East medal. Okay. Oh, all together. Oh, okay. yeah. Good. Gotcha. Okay. okay. I did not serve in the Middle East, no. Okay. Thank you. Now, talk about uh, your Korean War experience, how you ended up going back into the military, <clears throat> how you ended up serving in Korea. And well, I went back in March of 1948 into the military. Um, the economic situation wasn't all that great, and I I got a job working for the county agent and doing his farming, and I knew that I didn't want to be a farmer, so I just I finally decided decided I'd just get back in the military and see what I can make out of that, which. Uh, I went to airborne school and became a paratrooper and a gliderman, and then I applied for officer candidate school and was accepted, and that's that's uh, what terminated in my uh, commission in October of 1949, okay. just in time to be shipped to. Uh, Okinawa and be uh, next door to Korea when it broke out. I was commissioned engineers. <clears throat> uh, 
I didn't want to be an engineer, didn't think I was qualified. Was transferred to the infantry, reported in to Okinawa to this colonel, second engineer group. And he said, what are you doing with those cross rifles on? And I explained to him that I, that I transferred to the infantry. He says, put that castle back on and don't take it off. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so I was still an engineer, like it or not. <laughs> so I, uh, I can remember helping him to get ready. Uh, all the vehicles had been not too well maintained and all of a sudden we're getting parts very easily and we're able to repair our vehicles like they should have been in the first place. And we're getting ready to go to Korea. And uh, I arrived there on the 29th day of July, which was a little over a month after the war started. And I was immediately transferred to another engineer outfit. I had been in a construction battalion. I was transferred to the 11th Engineer Combat Battalion. Uh, and we moved eastward to uh, a little town called Masan. And uh, that's where we got our uh, extra vehicles to bring us up to full strength. And those vehicles had been uh, in receipt of a good coat of paint and damn little else. Uh, one or two of them, I couldn't even get them to move. And here I am trying to not only get the vehicles to move, but to teach some of these young soldiers how to drive the blooming things. <laughs> it was not a good situation. And I don't think the average uh, person uh, can visualize being in a situation like that. We were short of people, we were short of vehicles, we were short of so many things in the early days of Korea. And yet, it had to be. I mean, that's the way things were, so you do the best you can. <coughs> did that eventually change as the Yes, it did. Conflict kept going. You yes, started. I think I think by the time I left there the following year I think things were pretty good shape, relatively speaking. Okay. Uh, but boy, there to start. <clears throat> if you want to take the symbols, you start with a division, and you say that uh, there's a, a regiment missing. You take the regiment, and you say there's a battalion missing. And you take the battalion, you say there's a company missing. And you take the company, and you say there, there's a squad missing, I mean, a, a platoon missing. If you follow that on down to its logical ending, you have fewer people than a reinforced regiment has. And it's supposed to be a division. Yeah. It is the name only. So it's no wonder that we got some hard times there initially. Yeah. Well, talk about your experiences. And I know you were involved in combat in Korea. Talk about those and what you <clears throat> did, what your feelings were. My company had to ferry the 27th British Brigade across the Nakton River. My platoon was, was helping this. And uh, we couldn't get beer because the ladies, uh, see what is it, temperance unit? What, I forget the name of it. I think it's a... Women's Christian Temperance? Yes, that's it. They had prevailed on uh, uh, our leaders who in turn said that we wouldn't have any beer, among other things. But we noticed that the British did have beer. Pabst Blue Ribbon, as a matter of fact. 
and a couple of my guys would walk along behind these fellas that had this sack over their shoulder, you know. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> A couple of cans, <laughs> he won't notice. <laughs> the first thing I noticed, uh, my platoon sergeant uh, called to my attention there was a, a whole bunch of beer and we needed to go over and take care of that. <laughs> so <laughs> I was doing that when the battalion commander came down and was fussing at me for exposing my troops to uh, too much uh, artillery fire. There was a little old 76 over there somewhere that I think the guy was hiding it in a hole in the, in the mountain mm -hmm. and he would haul it out every now and then and shoot a couple at us. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't bothering anybody. <laughs> we, we, we would just duck, get out of the way, and after after these two rounds, we'd go back and do what we had to do. Well, he fussed and raised Cain about that. So that's when we were able to get some of the beer. <laughs> it was a great time. We went on from there, let's see. I, I was able to um, go to the 187th Airborne Infantry Re uh, Regimental Combat Team and they accepted me as, uh, as an addition to the regiment. And I brought that back to my company commander and showed it to him. And I had long since fallen out of favor with him, so I got a bad fishing report, which followed me the rest of my Army career. But I did get out of the engineers, and I, I made that second jump. In, in Korea, we made two jumps. And uh, I made the second one. We were trying to get behind the Chinese uh, and uh, mess up their parade a little bit. Talk about that, because that sounds like a pretty harrowing experience. It was. Uh, you know, you, airborne soldiers are rough and tough, and uh, you know they, they don't need eight, eight hours of sleep necessarily. They, They'll sleep when the work is done, and all that sort of stuff. Deep thinking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we jumped, and uh, then we almost immediately made a, a lateral movement to the west to intercept the Chinese, which we had not intercepted in the jump. And I was dead tired, and I think everybody else was. And I'm thinking, I'm a lieutenant. I can't. I can't do this. I've got to keep awake. And I was thinking that until I saw my regimental commander, brigadier general, was in his jeep, and he was sleeping. <laughs> I didn't feel so bad. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I never knew before that you could. You could sleep while walking, but I, I, it was kind of a dozy kind of a sleep, but it, it, it's sleep while you're walking. Wow. And we got over there and we, we were able to give the Chinese some fits. We, we, we went behind them and came in from, from the north. <clears throat> so I was able to hit them pretty hard. So you attack them? Yeah. Talk. Any details you want to give us about that? that I mean, that's, that's a pretty big deal when you go behind enemy lines and attack the enemy, particularly with the number of Chinese that were involved in that. War. Well, the truth of the matter is that, that we had set up so far from their objective that the, that the fire that I was putting on for my machine guns had a dispersion rate and was like this. I mean, you, you got the impression maybe one out of 20 rounds were in their zone where it could hit them. So it was not all that effective, but it, but it did the trick.
Now, what happened after that? Did they retreat, or did they have so many losses, some surrendered, or what, what was the no, conclusion they, of that battle? The conclusion was, as far as we were concerned, we, we simply moved out okay. and went south. Okay. And uh, it inflicted quite a bit of damage on the Chinese. Apparently. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That was so, a crazy war. Yeah. So continue with what happened from that point. I mean, did you well, have, any, have any more contact with the enemy before the war ended? Although I know it's not we, officially ended. <laughs> we came back and we were in in a tent, little tent city there south of Seoul and I guess it was from there that I was I was able to make the first army rotation back to the states. Okay. I, I had enough points this time yeah. <laughs> yeah. and uh, <clears throat> the story goes that the marine the marines had landed a little uh, a few days ahead of us, and they did, their appearance was not all that great. So the Pentagon sent a colonel all the way from Washington, or from somewhere, to be on the ship with us to make sure that we outshined the Marines when we landed. Hmm. So we spent a lot of time pressing uniforms and trying to get ribbons and medals and all that stuff. Yeah. And we had a, a, a sizable bunch of folks from the, the airborne unit that I was from. And this colonel put out the word that we would not wear our boots, our trousers and blouse when we got off the ship. <clears throat> we landed in Seattle. And we dutifully got off the ship without the trousers being bloused. But when we got to the end of the gangplank, each man bloused his trousers, marched off. <laughs> Our ranking officer at that time, I think, was a major. <laughs> but, but he okayed it. Well, you didn't disobey his orders. No. we. We made orders. <laughs> now, what did you do from the time you finished your service during the Korean conflict and Vietnam? Did you stay in well, the military or did you? Uh, yeah, I. <clears throat> do, you, do you have any idea what it means for your category not to be renewed when you're an officer? Generally, but I think you need to explain that for purposes okay. of the, the interview. As a reserve officer, you your category, in my case, in most cases, is a category three, which means you have a, a three-year commitment and at the end of which you will be evaluated to see if you continue. Uh, if, if you are evaluated at a high enough level, the continuance is pretty much automatic. <clears throat> this official report that I'd gotten was not serving me well, so in uh, 1958, I, was, uh, I had been a captain, and the day after when this action took place, I was a staff sergeant, which meant that I was I was being paid about 50% of what I had been as a captain. That's kind of hard to manage when you've got uh, a wife and three kids with their mouths open uh, wanting food in it, you know. So I had to make a decision. I went to uh, air defense school at Fort Bliss to learn how to be a radar technician. Any idea what it takes to, <laughs> to, to, to have a farm boy learn about electronics and how to repair radars? 
It's quite a process, but I made it. Uh, I went to a, <clears throat> a Nike Universal site at uh, Malibu, California. And since I had been a, a commission officer, this battery commander thought it would be a good assignment for me to be a platoon sergeant. Figuring, I guess, that I knew a lot about the military that maybe he didn't know. Well, it happens that there were two fellows in my platoon that outranked me. They were sergeant's first class, and I was a, 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 a staff sergeant. <clears throat> and I pointed this out to him, and he says, well, you don't, don't worry about that. If you have any trouble, you just come to me. And I thought, yeah, I'll come to you. <laughs> <laughs> My God. I mean, what makes people think that'll work? <laughs> Who knows? But dutifully, I, I tried to make it work. And fortunately, I didn't have much guff out of these guys. Uh, I just, I went and told them that I have to, I have to ask you to do this. I'm not. I, I knew better than to try to give him an order, yeah. for pity's sake. Yeah. But that was a very interesting. Yeah. And they were, and of course, being a new outfit like this, they were interested in making everything look good. So they were painting rocks and they were doing all sorts of things to make the area look good. One thing they had sort of neglected was cleaning the latrine as they went along. So. I ended up doing most of that myself, huh. but I cleaned the blooming latrine, and it passed inspection. When you do it yourself, you know it's going to be done right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Before so, we get into your Vietnam service, we skipped over one minor detail. You said you were married and had three kids by that time. <laughs> when did you have time to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well. I was married when I was a second lieutenant. So the kids came along before, well, before I had to go back to enlisted status. Okay. Does, that, does that clarify it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Eventually there were four kids. Okay. Now, talk about years le leading up to Vietnam, how you ended up going to Vietnam and what your experiences were in Vietnam. Okay. As I pointed out before, that, uh, that reduction of uh, to 50% of my former salary was pretty hard to live with and, and the long and short of it is that I couldn't live with it. So I got out on a hardship discharge and immediately became a deputy sheriff with Los Angeles County. There were 3,000 of us in uniform at that time, so we were not a small force. I can remember the first morning at the academy, going through the sheriff's academy, this tall, slender young deputy slammed open the door pointed his finger at us and you, you idiots, line up and call them threes or some damn thing like that, you know. I said, uh oh, here we go again. I've, I've been in these situations before. <laughs> so, but, but it, was a, it was a very good sheriff's academy. I mean, they knew what they were doing. Uh, we'd, we were having physical training and you, you'd, uh, You'd be double timing, you know, and call him to threes, and he would give you a command to run up that hill. Well, the hill looked like an inverted ice cream cone. I mean, that doggone thing came up like this. The fact is, he didn't expect you to r literally run up that hill. He simply wanted you to try it. Mm -hmm. And I knew this, so I tried it. I didn't get up for it before, but he didn't bother with me because I tried it. Yeah. And I tried to point this out to some of my 
classmates, <laughs> they didn't pay much attention to yeah. me. Mm -hmm. But I never had any problems. So I came out of that academy as a full-fledged deputy sheriff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I was also a reserve officer uh, training once a month over at the, uh, in Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And I was able to wear my captain's bars again. And that eventually got me a full-time assignment at 6th Army Headquarters in my rank of Major. And I got a, I still got the paperwork somewhere. It's, I had a commitment of nine, I think it was nine months and two days. And during that nine months and two days, I was able to get a Category 2 situation. And that set me up to uh, have a full-time assignment at another headquarters. I went to Fort Gordon, Georgia, and was the assistant G1 uh, until this fellow called from the Pentagon and wanted to know if there's any reason I couldn't be sent to Vietnam. <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. I explained to him that uh, I had uh, sold my house and I had bought a new car so that I could get back and forth to work. My family was in uh, a good situation. My children were in school. And uh, he said, yeah, but is there any reason you can't go to Vietnam? <laughs> I said, sir, would you mind telling me when it's going to happen? <laughs> I knew it was hopeless. But he said that they were, they were short of field grade officers in the combat arms. And what year was this? This was 1968. Okay. When I got to Vietnam, there were, I ran into two or three majors who had been sent to forward units and they didn't have a job for them. Shows you how short they were of combat arms officers. <laughs> Deep thinking. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to, 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 be, to, to, to get the assignment as a, a executive officer of a civil affairs company, the 41st Civil Affairs which I thoroughly enjoyed because I was, I was able to, you know, getting out into the field was, you don't just drive a Jeep out, out there, you, yeah. you, you get on the airplane and land at, a, at an airfield somewhere and, and get a vehicle from there somehow. We had, I think it was 14 teams situated throughout the southern half of Vietnam. And I visited each one of those teams. I don't know that anybody else ever did that, but I did. And I was able to know what the heck they were doing and what they needed. And uh, I enjoyed the fact that Everybody else is fighting a war, or most everybody else is fighting a war, and we're trying to fight for the peace in wartime. Talk about what the mission was of, of your well, organization. Well, you, you were trying to teach the people that, that are local how to work with their government to improve their situation. Uh, basic things like uh, Uh, where does where does the water go when it rains? Uh, ideally, you want it to drain out of, out of the immediate area into some disposal somewhere, or or simply away from from wherever you are. So you try to teach the people that they can work with their government in Saigon and uh, solve some of these problems. So even though we lost that blooming thing, that war. I still feel good 
feel good about what I was doing. So you got to know the Vietnamese people pretty well, yeah. better than most soldiers who were stationed in Vietnam. I was given a, a, a bow and arrow for, by a, a Montagnard chief. A crossbow. Huh? Yeah. In fact, I put it into the museum in, at the state capitol later on. Did you really? Yeah. And that's there now? I don't know where it is. I, I'm not sure what's happened to that museum. Is. They should have put that into a permanent building, but then that that would take some taxpayer money. So I guess that's a that's a good reason why they don't. And where were you stationed? What town or city? What when you were in Vietnam? Yeah, Nha Trang. Nha Trang, okay. Yeah, the coast. Yeah, okay. Do you know what the spelling is? No, sir. Mm -hmm. N H A T R A N G. Thank you. <clears throat> and were your teams all in the two core area? Which yes. Was, well, maybe you could explain what, for the purposes of the interview, where that is in Vietnam, generally. <clears throat> Wait a minute, it's not, it's not in a two core areas. I force, first force, Vietnam. Uh, I had a team out in, uh, gee, I'm having trouble remembering the name of this town now. But your central point was the track, and then you yeah. go out from there. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, that had to be a very interesting. It was a satisfying assignment. It was. Each team had an interpreter. <laughs> Funny thing, one of these guys was a Russian interpreter. He'd been through the the uh, language school and all that good stuff. He was tone deaf. How the, how the heck he ever got to be an interpreter is beyond me. But he, but he was effective. Huh. I mean, he did his job. I don't know how they communicated, but they did. Was there anything else you want to talk about, about your service in Vietnam? Any experiences or anything that you'd like to well, be recorded? Well, I got the opportunity <clears throat> to uh, go to the 5th Special Forces, which by the way was commanded by a colonel. He and I were lieutenants together at Fort Campbell back in hmm. 1951. Huh. And uh, of course my, my story was different from his. He, he never got out of the Army and I did. Yeah. So it was not unusual for him to be two ranks ahead of me. But uh, they had a little unit they call Installation Defense Command, which means you're responsible for the defense of your immediate area, which also worked with the defense of the uh, uh, I-Force V headquarters itself. I was able to go on. I, I was able to go on uh, what were called sniffer missions. You are in a in a Huey with uh, two gunships, and uh, this sniffer can detect smoke and urine. The urine capability was not used because. Does it come from a person or a buffalo? But buffaloes don't smoke, so <laughs> the smoke mission works well. And I remember, and I could call in artillery on mm -hmm. where, where needed. And I can remember one morning being up there and this, we had spotted this fellow up ahead of us. And that sucker was firing that. They had these anti-tank guns that are about this long. And I think that was a, a 30, 30 millimeter or 20, maybe it was a 20 millimeter round. And that sucker was firing right up at us, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking, man, he's got gall to even shoot at us, you know, with these two gunships out here. Yeah. He really has gall. 
but I was mighty glad it missed. <laughs> so you would go up and the gunships would go in. Right? Yeah. Mm. How were you treated when you got back from Vietnam? You have a lot of stories about how soldiers were not treated well. I was not on public display all that much, so I, I missed most of that, I suppose. I don't remember being directly fussed at yeah. at all. But I know that other people were. Yeah. I was well aware of that. Did you stay in the Army once you came back from Vietnam? I did. Uh, I went to 3rd Army Headquarters, was assigned to the Deputy Chief of Staff Operations and Training as an operations officer. It was an airborne slot, so I got to jump again. After 16 years, I'm getting to jump again. So. I went down to Fort Benning and uh, they wanted me to go practice some PLFs and, you know, just get generally re-familiarize myself with what do you do when you get up in that airplane? Uh, I went down at one point and was able to get on a, on a helicopter. And I had never made a jump from a helicopter before. And it was uh, beginning to be dark. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I'm seeing down below that, that, that there's water. And uh, I jumped out of that thing and it was the smoothest thing I've ever, smoothest jump I've ever made. And I landed like a dream. And uh, I'm thinking, if I can get another one of these, I'm going <laughs> to. Yeah. It was a real, real pleasure. Did you ever jump any more? Excuse me? Did you ever jump any more after that? I may have made one or two. It's just enough to keep the pay coming. Now, 3rd Army Headquarters was in Atlanta. Yes, it was. Fort McPherson. Fort McPherson. Okay. And it's whatever is resulted from that is now at uh, Fort Fort Bragg. Yeah. Okay. So how long did you stay in the army before you? Uh, uh, December of uh, seventy one okay. was when I got out, and I had managed to uh, land a job with the Secretary of State for Georgia. Do you happen to know Ben Fortune? Ben Fortune, yes. Uh, he, was lot, he was around a long time. As yes, State. he was. He was a master politician. He sure was. That door was almost always open. If it was closed, it meant that he was indisposed for just a yeah. brief period of time. Then it was opened up again. And you could, I don't care who you were, you could walk up and talk to him. That's a good he, qual quality for him. Yeah. Indeed. Person in government. If 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 he was if the person was from Massachusetts or California, it didn't matter. You could talk to Ben Forsen. We'll spend a little time talking about what you did from that point up to the present. Family well, or whatever you did or whatever you you would like to be part of your story on. I decided. Let's see when I when I I. I uh, Graduated from uh, Oglethorpe, and then I decided I'd go to law school, but I was also a personnel officer, and personnel officers, at least the one I've known, ones I've known, you work 24 hours, not 24 hours, but you work during the day, you're you're busy as a personnel officer. When do you study? Mm -hmm. So, I was I was always going to to uh, grab a bite to eat, and I'd try to study my lesson. 
I made pretty good grades, but I never passed the bar. And I know what's the matter, but. Yeah. But you made it through law school. Yeah. And it's it's been beneficial. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. In fact, I don't think any decent school, in my opinion, if you want to <coughs> go through that school, you're going to learn things that will benefit you. By the way, I wish, I wish I had learned about our founding fathers in grade school. Yeah. And when I become dictator, everybody's going to learn in grade school. That's good. I'll, we'll support you 100%. <laughs> We won't have any choice. We're we'll get... <laughs> dictator. We won't. You're right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, you want to talk about your family at all? I know you said you had what, four children. My first wife uh, passed away in 1985 from cancer. Uh, I didn't realize this. She she was really an alcoholic. And she smoked all the time. So her final days were spent in bed with a flap of skin up here to her throat, hoping that it would grow and yeah. with cosmetic surgery at least. Uh -huh. And she passed away and I was I was fortunate to find another lady that I'm presently married to and we've been at it we've been at it for 30 years now and we think about making it permanent <laughs> well congratulations <laughs> so in my obituary which I've already written one of the things it says that I consider myself lucky very lucky to have loved and been loved by two women in my lifetime. You are lucky. I consider myself very fortunate. Yeah. The Lord is kind to me, yeah. and I'm very aware of it. Well, I'm sure you've been a great husband to both of them. I hope so. <laughs> I'm not sure what else I can add. But Children? You... Oh, I have... Uh, a daughter who lives on Vashon Island, just off of Seattle, Lib country. <laughs> her 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 husband Pete is uh, he's really he really fusses about that all the time because some of those stupid things that take place in that government. It's kind of hard to believe. So uh, when I send him any of these conservative things, he's already he's probably already gotten it. <laughs> uh, I have a, a daughter who lives who now lives in uh, <clears throat> Florida, and uh, they they have a, a house and another house with. 10, 12 acres. They've got, I think they've got five horses. And I don't know where she gets this affinity for horses, but she has really gone into it. She, she trains horses and trains kids to ride horses. And uh, like I say, I didn't want to be a farmer. <laughs> and that's why I went elsewhere. <laughs> so I don't know where she gets this, but she's good at it. My youngest daughter lives in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and she was a nurse practitioner, but she decided she'd take care of the kids, so she didn't do that for several years. He still is a nurse practitioner, and uh, he's an ob Oh, when you, when you gas people to put them out for... for Anesthesiologists. Anesthesiologists. I think, uh, yeah, I think he can call himself an anesthesiologist, yeah. So he does that all the time. Well, sounds like you've got successful children. Yeah. 
I've got a son in California. He's uh, he served in the Army Medical Corps, and you can be in the Medical Corps and not be much, not do much soldiering, but uh, and he didn't. <laughs> And he works, I think he's an illustrator or something in a magazine now. He and I don't, we don't uh, have much contact, unfortunately. I don't know, I don't know what I did to cause this to, to happen, but it happened. Well, there's still time. Well, I keep hoping. We'll see. I want to see if uh, Sue or Roger have any questions or comments. Or You mentioned you got the uh, combat infantry badge in World War II. Did you get one in Vietnam also? No, if, if I said World War II, I was mistaken. I got it in Korea. In Korea. Yeah. I beg your pardon, in Korea. You did. Yes. And I only got it one time. You don't. You don't get it for being in uh, civil affairs. I don't know about special forces. I don't know. I don't think you get it for special forces either. Hmm. See, you have a I'm just yeah. curious, as a yeah. veteran of three wars, what are your thoughts? Three wars. I, I'm just amazed. I think wars are or among mankind's stupidest pursuits. Wouldn't it be nice if we were smart enough to settle our differences without fighting? Having said that, if I had it all to do over, I would start sooner and, and go to schools which would teach me, teach me better how to fight wars, because we're too damn dumb to do it otherwise. So I want to be good at it. And my idea of, of, of wars is not to kill people, but to eliminate or reduce their ability to fight me. And if I can do that without killing a single person, that's great. I don't know how many people think that way. But I think everybody ought to. We need more deep thinkers, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Think, damn it. <laughs> well, you've got an amazing story. I mean, I, I think all three of us would agree that we've talked to a lot of veterans, a lot of different conflicts, and that I know, I don't think any of us have actually interviewed somebody that was involved in th three different wars. And you have a combination of a sense of humor, obviously, but you've obviously got good judgment. And I, one thing that impressed me is when you were over the unit that had two members that actually outranked you. You know, a lot of people would take advantage of that and lord it over them, but you were smart enough and had enough good judgment to treat them the way you should have treated them, and I'm sure they appreciated it, and they were more effective because of that. A lesson I learned from a young black fellow in the Airborne Battalion, when I finished Airborne, uh, and I became a paratrooper, of course, and I was assigned to F Company of that battalion, that training battalion. Uh, the company commander was, well, I don't want to fuss about him too much, but he's not my idea of a company commander. There was a duty sergeant there, but both these fellows were married and I wasn't. So it fell to me to be the duty sergeant after hours. Sometimes during hours, even though that duty sergeant was present, but anyway, I had to, I had to help him. So I'm out there one day talking to this young black fellow. And back then, 
if you didn't make it through airborne training, you were automatically a quitter. This kid was a quitter. I went out there and I had to had to tell him to do something. And I said, hey boy, when you're finished, do so and so. He was about like this on me and he drew himself up to his full height. And he says, you don't call me no boy. I'm a soldier. And I'm thinking, what in the world did I do? <laughs> My thought was, this kid is about my age, so I was talking to him as a boy, as, mm -hmm. as if I'm the other boy. Yeah. Yeah. But he obviously didn't see it that way, and I now understand. In fact, I really understood then. It did, just didn't occur to me. I didn't think. Yeah. <laughs> so I began to learn one of life's lessons right then and there. I don't think I ever said boy to a yeah. black fella ever again. Well, we all live and learn. Yes, we our do. Whole lives. <laughs> and I also want to point out before we stop uh, what you did in all three of your assignments. And uh, you're very modest about it, but you really put your life in danger in all three of those. And I know in Vietnam you weren't in combat, but everybody was in combat in Vietnam because yeah. of the type of yeah. war it was. And obviously in uh, Korea, parachuting or going in behind enemy lines is is very high risk and we all know what the stories are about the troops heading east going across France and Germany yeah. and Czechoslovakia so you put your life on the line and you served three different tours and spent a long time in the military and you, you really deserve credit for that and I know we're proud of you and, and I'm sure your family's proud of you and I want to give you one more chance to just say anything you want to say to sum up before we stop. The thing of it is, in all three instances, I could have been killed or have some part of my body damaged somehow or my mind. Uh, I think I was just lucky that I never faced situations like so many soldiers do where the probability of be being hurt or killed is greater than what I experienced. So I'm, I'm lucky. And grateful. <laughs> I think God has been kind. God is kind to everybody. But damn if I don't think He's got a special place for me sometimes. <laughs> well, I can't think of a better way to, <laughs> to end the interview. And I want to really thank you for coming in here and doing this. And more than that, I want to thank you for your service. Well, as far as I'm concerned, each and every one of us who is fortunate enough to live in the United, these United States ought to feel an obligation for service. I mean, come on folks, you're lucky. Look at all this other stuff that goes on in the world. You're so, you're so right. Yep. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. This was great, thank you. Well, you're sure you're more than welcome. Well, that was that was.